All right. Um, first of all, um, thanks a lot, um, Egert and Ziegler, for giving us, Presirix, the opportunity to, uh, to show uh, the, our platform, the single domain antibody platform, and how we use it uh, as a Theranostic uh, application. Um, as Professor Scotelius mentioned, indeed, so we approach it a bit differently, uh, in a sense that for us, um, the therapeutic compound is, um, is the core, uh, so that's how we start development. And so for us, imaging uh, enters uh, as a tool to select patients. So uh, today we are, a bit of background uh, about the company, so we are Presirix, uh, we are a clinical stage oncology company um, focusing on therapeutics. So we have um, a platform uh, and a rich pipeline. Um, so the lead compound is uh, today in clinical translation, clinical evaluation. Um, so that would be the iodinated uh, HER2 targeting uh, single domain antibody. And here we aim to treat HER2 positive metastatic breast and gastric cancer with or without metastases. So a bit of um, background on uh, the platform. So single domain antibodies are the smallest uh, naturally occurring uh, antibody fragment. Um, you can see it here on the, uh, sorry. You can see it here on the, uh, on the right side. So um, in fact, what you have is uh, in particular animals in the Camelidae species, you, so camels, llamas, etc. you have uh, next to your conventional antibodies, a very particular uh, type of antibody referred to as an heavy chain only antibody. Uh, so they lack the light chain, but they're fully functional for, uh, for antigen binding. And so the, um, the variable domain, so the, the antigen binding domain, uh, also referred to as a VHH, is in fact a single domain antibody. So it's small, about 15 to, uh, uh, 12 to 15 kilodalton, um, so very similar to, I mean, it's a bit larger than peptides, but behaves quite, uh, quite similar. And so we obtain single domain antibodies by immunizing camels or llamas with our antigen of interest. Um, so that uh, generates an immune reaction, uh, and we can obtain from that uh, a library of potential binders. And so here is where we uh, already make the distinction between therapeutic applications and, and imaging applications, because we really select for the therapeutic intent. And, and here we have um, you know, particular characteristics that, that we require, as was mentioned in the introduction uh, talk. So we look a lot at uh, binding characteristics, but especially retention. You know, upon binding, it should retain, it should allow for uh, the deposition of cytotoxic radiation. We look a lot at uh, stability to allow for straightforward chemistry. It is a biological, so that has, uh, from time to time, can have limitations on what you can do. Um, and so in general, as mentioned, like peptides, so fast on target upon IV administration, and they are cleared via the kidneys. Very important feature, uh, and that is very common with our single domain antibodies, is that uh, you know, upon tumor targeting, they uh, penetrate very efficiently in tumor tissue, uh, and they are retained uh, significantly. And so we have already a few of these type of compounds in the clinic, um, also for other applications. And so in general, you would consider they're a camel derived, um, but it has been shown that they are very low in, um, I mean, or very low immunogenicity when uh, administered to patients. So we position our platform a bit between the peptide platform and the uh, monoclonal antibody platform. Uh, as mentioned, um, it's a platform technology. We can generate single domain antibodies against any relevant target of interest. In size, a bit larger than peptides. Um, and um, so but behave very similarly. Uh, so the kidneys here are uh, the dose limiting organ, focusing uh, on the therapeutic application, of course. So in the field, there is an increasing um, level of evidence on the use of uh, the single domain antibody platform in you know, what we would call immuno-oncology in general. Um, so a lot of academic efforts uh, and industry efforts on uh, getting this platform um, into, into the clinic. And so focusing on the nuclear theranostics, a bit with the space where we are all in, uh, we see an increasing number of relevant proof of concepts uh, using the single domain antibody platform at a variety of, of relevant targets. Um, and um, radio labeled with both diagnostic and therapeutic uh, radioisotopes. And as mentioned, a few of those have already entered the clinic. Uh, so we have a few finished and ongoing clinical trials evaluating um, single domain antibodies in uh, nuclear theranostics. 
So this is the Presirix product pipeline, as already uh, shown uh, in the introduction. So um, our lead compound is a HER2 uh, targeting compound. Um, and so the lead compound labeled with uh, IDA131 is in clinical evaluation. And we are um, assessing or developing um, a runner-up uh, second generation compound labeled with directinum 225. Um, second asset is a FAP targeting single domain antibody uh, that's in uh, late uh, preclinical R&D. So we aim to have the iodinated compound translated into the clinic uh, in the course of next year. And then we have an, a more on the discovery level, we have a folate targeting single domain antibody. Uh, and as mentioned, so we, uh, we look at you know, the, the potential of imaging. Uh, we, we consider that relevant for imaging, uh, for, sorry, for patient selection. And so when we look at our elite asset, it's the iodinated compound. We can take use of the teranostic principle of, or the teranostic character of uh, iodine itself. Uh, so um, a biomarker dose would allow us to uh, identify patients with um, HER2 positive lesions. And, but we have here the aim to, uh, to include the, um, the gallium tracer uh, for PET imaging. And so this is, in fact, why we are here. Um, so this is where we meet uh, Eckert and Ziegler. So we are doing this together, um, getting the two tracers uh, into the clinic. And so the aim is for both FAP and, and HER2 uh, to get that, uh, to get that um, ready and available to, uh, to get to clinical sites in the course of uh, for 23. So we just going to focus a bit. I have a few slides I would like to show on the on the lead asset, and then uh, to end uh, a few on our uh, preclinical asset being the FAP compounds. When it comes to HER2, uh, not to go into detail, but so within the the HER2 positive space, uh, it's still a big unmet need, uh, especially when um, you know you have metast uh, metastasized disease. Uh, so there is an unmet need for new. Um, you know, assets, new targeting uh, compounds that can, uh, that can enter uh, the field and that can, again, um, you know, prove benefit over what is today the standard of care. So um, when we select compounds, uh, so we really select for particular characteristics. Uh, so beyond what we would call binding characteristics, as I already mentioned, we also look at particularities in where they bind. Uh, so um, our lead compound here, um, we selected this compound especially for the purpose of binding a spot or an epitope on HER2 that is distinct from uh, a lot of the standard of care. Uh, and this has benef potential benefits. Uh, so uh, first of all, you have a few resistance mechanisms that exist that are um, you know, linked to uh, particular epitopes on HER2 receptor. And that's where you have, for example, Herceptin or Pajeda uh, susceptible for. And so we believe that with our compound entering uh, or at least binding a different epitope that you can at least overcome certain uh, resistant mechanisms. And so binding another epitope also allows for combination therapies uh, with standard of care. Um, and uh, lastly, it, it's a space where you know um, radio pharmaceuticals are not yet uh, in um, tri standard of care, and so we enter with a new mode of action. And so, especially when you talk about HER2 expression heterogeneity, we believe that again there we have uh, we have an, um, an, a benefit. So the compound itself, uh, not to go in detail, has been extensively um, evaluated preclinically, um, both for therapy for imaging. Uh, PET imaging, SPECT imaging, et cetera, different models looked at additive effects with the standard of care. And I think the upper picture is, is interesting um, because that really reflects, um, I mean, the core technology. So this is the iodinated um, HER2 uh, compound, and you see upon IV injection, fast on target. So you have here on the right hind leg, you have the tumor, um, and you see that the unbound fraction is, you know, is, is, is rapidly cleared from, uh, from bloodstream. And so you see early after injection, one hour post injection in these animals, you see it all concentrated in kidneys, but after 24 hours, everything is gone. And so the only thing that is remaining is the specific retention in the tumor. So this compound has already been, um, on an academic level, has been um, evaluated quite extensively. So here, this is in a, a finished academic trial where the gallium compound was evaluated in, in a set of, of, uh, of patients. Um, so you see here on the, on the left side, um, the CAMHER2, gallium CAMHER2, specifically targeting a primary lesion, 
the middle picture gives you an example of a um, patient with metastatic disease. Uh, and then interestingly, on the right side, this is a patient with an HER2-positive brain lesion. And so here we clearly see, and that's also where we believe that the technology has, um, has benefit uh, in a sense that, uh, that, that efficient penetration, that efficient tissue penetration, uh, we believe um, is of particular interest when targeting lesions in the brain. Um, the therapeutic compound was then evaluated in the first clinical trial. Um, so this is, again, was a biomarker study. We wanted to understand the behavior of the iodinated compound uh, and use the data obtained uh, to do dosimetry for an eventual uh, therapeutic trial. And so um, here we were able to show that indeed the behavior uh, of what we see in human was very similar to what we had observed in, uh, in, in rodents and higher species, uh, higher animal species. And um, we, we were able to show that that beneficial clearance pattern and that maintained uh, tumor targeting potential was, uh, was apparent in, the, in, in the patients, as you can see here, um, where you have a lesion in sternum and you see a specific targeting both early after IV injection as well as after 24 hours. And this, all this information and all these, this relevant work has led to uh, where we are today. So we have an ongoing uh, phase one, two clinical trial. Um, again here, so we look at safety, tolerability, dosimetry, and also uh, preliminary efficacy. Um, study consists of two parts. We have a dose escalation part, which is currently ongoing, where we are escalating the dose to treat, uh, which would then eventually move towards an expansion phase. And so it's in that expansion phase that we're also aiming to introduce imaging for patient selection, uh, so both um, the CAMHER2 iodine biomarker dose as well as the, the gallium compound uh, when, when that's up and, uh, up and running. And then to, uh, to, to finalize or to, to uh, finish this presentation, just a few words on our preclinical asset. So this is the compound that we aim to, uh, to translate uh, in the course of 23 targeting uh, FAP alpha. Um, not to go in detail, I think everybody's very much aware of, uh, of the relevance of FAP or at least the interest of FAP as a target, um, so described to be expressed on cancer-associated fibroblasts, but also on a particular, um, or at least on cancer cells in particular uh, indications. And so FAP expression itself in healthy adult tissues is uh, basal or, or uh, absent. So here again, we approach it from a therapeutic perspective. Um, so we selected a compound that would fit the requirements uh, that we believe um, we need to have efficient uh, therapy. And so here, um, what you have here is the, you know, a, a description of the, um, the binding characteristics. Again, so here we have a picomolar uh, affinity binder. But what is even more important is here the dissociation uh, constant, and so the K off or the, the speed at which it dissociates with the target. And this is an horizontal line, meaning it binds and it sticks. And that's what you want for a therapeutic. Uh, and so we deliberately looked for that type of compound. And in addition, um, and that this makes the distinction with the, uh, the inhibitors that exist today in the field. So we uh, target a position on FAP, an epitope on FAP that is distinct from the enzymatic cleft. So it binds uh, a position um, far away from the enzymatic cleft, and uh, it does not interfere with uh, FAP dimerization. And so that really makes us, or makes the compound different from what uh, is being uh, evaluated uh, today in, um, in a lot of these preclinical and clinical uh, investigations. So again, here we did the full uh, preclinical um, evaluation um, from, a, from an imaging uh, perspective. So the same compound labeled with gallium 68, labeled with iodine 131, uh, fully characterized. And again, here the same features um, are brought forward. Um, if we look here again at that, the, the, the SPECT image for uh, the iodinated compound, we see that very fast on target aspect uh, and that uh, fast clearance um, from blood through kidneys. And again, you have that same type of, of image. 24 hours, you see tumor targeting and no residual activity. And so this compound, together with its actinium-labeled counterpart, has already been, this is just one example of um, the therapeutic efficacy studies that we perform. So this is a head-to-head uh, iodine versus actinium. Um, and so um, what is clear is that this compound, not only in its imaging potential, but also in its therapeutic potential, uh, shows um, yeah, shown um, um, relevance. And so here we saw for both the iodinated and the actinium-labeled compound a dose-dependent response and uh, no signs of, of acute toxicity. 
And so uh, this is the, the compound that we are, again, as mentioned, we are moving forward with in the course of 23 to, uh, to get that into, um, into patients. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention.